If you want to put a question to Richard Dawkins, one of the world's most famous thinkers, he's live on Talkback this morning, this afternoon. Linda's on the line. Hi, Linda. Hi, William. How are you? Doing very well. Go ahead. Uh, a point that I just wanted to make was, uh, you know, Richard had referred there to religious indoctrination. Um, he, he, Richard does. He seems to think that uh, you know that belief in God and an understanding and acceptance of the theory of evolution are somehow mutually exclusive. That you know, that, I mean, it does say in the Bible and I, exactly where it says I can't remember, but it does say in the Bible that for God, one day is like a thousand years. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they you know the seven days of creation. They look at that and it, you know they take it very literally that God created the world in exactly seven days. But it does say elsewhere in the Bible, as I said, that for God one day is like a thousand years. And R I think that's a, a misunderstanding that, that Richard seems to have. So, Richard, you can believe in the Bible and believe in evolution. Yeah, They're not in contradiction. Be, one day would have to be a good deal more than a thousand years. It would have to be about a hundred million years or a bit more than that. Um, that is certainly a way of reconciling the Bible with um, with science. I'm not sure why you bother, though, because when you think back to who actually wrote the book of Genesis... The authors of the book of Genesis had no special expertise. There's no reason why you should try to reconcile what they say with science, because they knew no science. How could they? They were desert camel herders. Thanks for that, Linda. Leslie is there from Balna Hinge, Leslie. Hello, sir. Go ahead, Leslie. I'd just like to, to understand her, try and explain something to me, right? We have the creation, right? We have the moon, 240,000 miles from the Earth, right? If it was a bit further away, the water would stagnate. The water, that's the water cycle for the Earth, right? The Earth needs the water to keep it cool, right? If it was a bit closer, if it was a bit further away, a bit closer, the, the water would be over the roof of the houses. It's just in the right distance, right? That's going in its proper orbit, just at the right distance. Yeah, then I, we have I'm familiar sun. with the argument. Oh, um, I, I think and I then we have the sun, 93 million miles away. If it was a bit closer, the Earth would burn up. Further away, all life would perish on the Earth. So, Leslie, what you're saying but is... Everything it's, is in order. What I'm trying to say It's perfectly is, placed, almost as if God set the, the, the moon exactly where it should be to make enough water on the planet. Is that, is that the well, point? What, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to point out is everything is in the right orbit. The planet uh, Jupiter shields the Earth from large meteorites. Everything is in design and order. There must be a designer. Then we have laws, laws of inertia, laws of gravity. How can something come from nothing? All right. This yeah, big bang really theory about the, um, about the star reaching the North Star and the, and the a, a collision. Yeah, let, let's hear Where a response from... Come from? Let's right. hear a response from Richard Dawkins. It's the design <laughs> argument, essentially, Richard. Yeah. Um, th this is a... This is a a, fa a favourite argument, it, it's often brought up. There are billions and billions of planets in the universe, and the great majority of them, of course, are unsuitable for life. Of course, we have to be on the kind of planet where the moon is in just the right position and the sun is in just the right position, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And on the great majority of planets in the universe, there is no life. But given that there is, given that we exist at all, we would have to live on a planet which had these properties that you're describing. It doesn't show design. It would only show design if all the planets in the universe had this wonderful property. But as far as we know, these uh, wonderful properties are very rare. Indeed, that's more or less an implication of what, of what you were saying. So it doesn't have to mean design. It, ha it, it simply means that the odds against this happening are indeed very large, and we are on one of the very rare planets where it is possible for us to live. How could it be otherwise? Brian on his mobile asks Richard, evolution, he says, is making things better. How are people getting more evil and things are getting worse if evolution is true? Well, it isn't really making things better. It's simply making creatures that survive better and reproduce better. And a naive interpretation of the idea of natural selection might indeed expect that things would be getting worse because it might, naively, we might think that uh, those creatures who are most ruthless, most selfish, most vicious would be the ones who are most likely to prevail in competition with each other and survive. So in a way, the boot's on the other foot. In a way, we have to explain why we are as nice as we are. We've talked about how teachers, some teachers, are nervous about teaching these ideas today. Darwin was actually quite nervous about publishing them, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He went for ooh, 15 or so years. Uh, after he first wrote the theory down before publishing it. And eventually, in 1858, he was 
prompted to publish it by the fact that somebody else, Alfred Wallace, uh, thought of it separately. And indeed, one could have imagined, uh, anticipated that that would happen. So Darwin was reluctant. Possibly he was reluctant because he was afraid of a sort of backlash against the idea. In particular, he knew that his wife was very religious and that she might have been upset. But I think also that Darwin may have been just a bit of a perfectionist who wanted to get absolutely everything right in his exposition, uh, get all the evidence together before he went public, and he very nearly left it too late. Uh, Richard, who was Robert Fitzroy, and what is his connection to Belfast? Uh, Robert Fitzroy was the captain of the Beagle, which was the ship that Darwin went around the world on, and um, Darwin was engaged to be Fitzroy's gentleman companion. Fitzroy was worried about going mad because he had madness in his family, and the previous captain of the Beagle had indeed committed suicide. So Fitzroy and Darwin shared a cabin on the Beagle and uh, shared and they had their meals together. Um, and so they talked a lot. Fitzroy was a devout creationist and um, as Darwin himself was at that time. They had arguments. Fitzroy was in favor of slavery. Darwin was against slavery. You ask about his um, Fitzroy's connection with Belfast, I'm very ashamed to say I don't know. This is like a trivial pursuit question, I'm sorry about this. Um, in fact, his mother was the daughter of the first Marquess of Londonderry and the half-sister of Viscount Castlereagh, who became Home Secretary. And Richard, just so you know, there's a Fitzroy area of Belfast. I didn't know Connected that, with, the, Viscount, with the Fitzroy Viscount family. Viscount Castlereagh actually was, did kill himself, I think, didn't he? Yes, that, that's right. And that yeah. was one of the reasons why uh, Fitzroy was worried about his own sanity. Next time you come to Belfast, I'll show you Fitzroy okay. Avenue, very famous street in Belfast. Also here, Philip Campbell, the Reverend Philip Campbell from the Congregational Union of Ireland, asking, has Richard Dawkins uh, seen the scientific dissent from Darwin list hundreds of PhDs in science who oppose Darwinism? Yes, um, these people have PhDs in all sorts of weird subjects. They very, very seldom have PhDs in relevant subjects. They tend to have PhDs in marine engineering and things like that. I can assure you there is very, very, very little reputable, knowledgeable dissent from evolution in the scientific world. Indeed, there is zero dissent, rep reputable dissent from the fact of evolution. There might be a certain amount of dissent from the theory of natural selection. We've got uh, Sam on the line from Belfast. Good afternoon, Sam. Good afternoon. You're good live in talk back. Go ahead. Hawkins. Yes, good afternoon to you. Uh, just, just listening to the debate here. Uh, one point I would say to you, it seems that the impression, Professor Dawkins, you seem to be giving that it's only religious people who are opposed to evolution. That, that would not be true. There are many people who are not religious who are opposed to the concept of evolution, including many scientists. Well, uh, on what uh, grounds? Let me just finish, please, and then I'll, I'll listen to you. But you're aware of Anthony Flew. Oh, yes. Anthony Flew, probably one of the leading atheists in the United Kingdom, not a religious man. He has rejected evolution because he could not see how the first cell could come about by a process of natural selection. Yes, um, I don't know whether you've question. seen Anthony Flew's book. He didn't write it. It was written by a man called Roy Varghese. Anthony Flew is 85 years old, and uh, he is, he's admitted that him, himself he's no longer capable of writing a book. This book was ghost-written by a Christian propagandist, and I think it's hard to resist the conclusion that this Christian propagandist, Roy Varghese, has been exploiting an old man and has written a book putting the old man's name to the book, uh, and I think this is really rather a wicked way to treat an old man who was once a great philosopher. Well, I think that's an unfortunate uh, way to tackle the problem by undermining uh, the credibility of Anthony Flew. Are you suggesting that Anthony Flew wrote, wrote that book himself? himself? Because he didn't. He, he's admitted he did not write that book. He did, we're not talking about the writing of the book. We're yes, talking we about are. The That's exactly what we're talking about. The principle about. in which the book was written was that Anthony Flew had a difficulty with the subject of natural selection, reference the first cell, which, which you haven't addressed in this question to yourself, respectfully. Anthony Flew has concluded that he, he no longer is an atheist. He's not a theist, he's a deist. He believes that uh, there is some kind of creative intelligence that started the universe off in the first place. Anthony Flew most certainly does not doubt evolution. He does doubt atheism. He has become a deist. Thank you for that, Sam.